Hey folks, Eric Cabral, founder of On Air Brands, talking about personal branding, podcasting, and how to grow your business using a podcast. Listen to this and more, pouring a ton of value into you and your life. Catch me on The Jesse T Show. Mr. Eric Cabral, what is going on, brother? What is up, brother? So yeah. happy, looking forward to this. For, for many, many weeks, man. Happy to be here. Same, man. We, we just, uh, we have this beautiful connection where we know we want to do some life together outside of this conversation, man. So to give everybody else some context on how that came about, tell us who you are, what do you do, and who is Eric? Yeah. So I'll try to provide as much context uh, by taking up little of your time and the audience's time. But yeah, Eric Cabral, I was in corporate America for 20 plus years uh, before I created my company uh, right now the media agency called On Air Brands, which creates podcasts and all the social media promotion around each episode. So, but before I got to that, I, I was in cube life, you know, hashtag cube life, just, you know, grinding it out and doing exactly what I was told. They get, go to a job and, and bleed corporate blue or whatever the, you know, corporate colors were and stay there for 30 years and collect that gold watch. And that's what my mission was. And I was very loyal to that, bro. Like staying in every job that I ever had. I think the longest stint was seven or eight years. Mm. Um, but if you look at my resume, that's what I was proud of. I was like, look, seven years here, eight years here, you know, 10 years here, whatever it was, it was like, I only had a few jobs. And dude, what I realized was after 20, you know, something years, I looked back at everything and I was just sort of like thinking about how I felt about life and I was miserable. So I was overweight, you know, I was, I was, I was, uh, depressed, uh, you know, a lot of that due to me just not sleeping a lot. Um, and just had limiting beliefs, all these things that I was just unaware of that I became aware of and enlightened and started to make moves to, to make change and, and, and change everything, really just flip the coin so that I could experience something else. And, and that's what brought us here today. What was the uh, two or three jobs that you had during that corporate career? What, what industry were you in? I, so creative, uh, I, was, I went to School of Visual Arts in Manhattan and I got my graphic design degree, a BFA. And I got my first job in the Bronx, New York, um, for a finance, um, I'm sorry, a, a fashion company, uh, retail. And it was great, dude. Like the, the getting paid to do artwork, like, Hey, we, we need you to make really pretty postcards and, and catalogs. And some of my stuff like made it to billboards on, on Jersey turnpike that we were talking about <laughs> the smelly, smelly Jersey turnpike. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, um, that was cool, man. Like out here, I was as a kid, you know, in my t early twenties, like, wow, I I'm making money and I'm just making stuff that comes natural to me. But over time it came really commoditized and sort of like taken for granted because I fast forward, climbed the corporate ladder in all these different companies, these fortune 500 companies. And I started, I got to the level where I wasn't doing the work, but I was uh, directing the work and building teams, internal teams for all these big companies. And they were basically saving money from my efforts by not having to spend hundreds of dollars on New York city agencies yeah. and farm and bringing it all in, in house. So I was the one of the, the cogs in the machine to help build that internal creative agencies so that you don't have to, you know, spend millions of dollars in, in New York city. So it got to the point where that was my reputation. Like, Hey, bring Eric Cabral in cause he's going to be able to help build an internal agency. And it was really the, the eureka moment for me, dude, was I, I got an opportunity to go work for the, one of the top pharma companies, if not the top. And they were like, we got, we got a New York city agency that we want you to build from scratch. And we got a Chicago agency that we inherited and we don't know what to do with it. So you're going to have to fly back and forth between New York city and Chicago, and that'll be your life. And I was like, what dream come true. <laughs> and then I look over at my wife who's pregnant with our second. And I'm like, I don't know, am I going to be around when the baby's born? I just saw my whole life flash before my eyes. I was like, I'm getting fatter. I'm getting lazier. I just know whatever it was, it just wasn't good. So I was like, I'm, I'm out. I'm like, no, Th thanks, but no thanks. They're like, wait, what? You're, you're not taking this job. <laughs> no, uh, I'm going to try something else. 
Were you yeah. uniquely positioned in terms of finance? Did you have money saved up? Did you have connections in place? Like in terms of burning the boats, did you burn the boats or were you driving Uber Eats for a while? Like how, did that, <laughs> how did that transition work? Because it's you so obviously good. had responsibilities beyond yourself. Yeah, hundred percent, dude. We made that decision. And I say we, meaning the, uh, the CEO of the house, my uh -huh. wife, <laughs> yeah. you know, I had to get approval before I was like, cause dude, she, she, she lived, uh, you know, we've been together for 18 years. Um, and 13 of those have been, you know, uh, marriage locked in, you know, this, this ring on my finger. And, um, I don't say I'm saying that in jest. I'm not saying that like, it's a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing, but I, I checked in with her. I'm like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing something else because I'm, kind of done with creative. I've been doing it all my life. Uh, there's, there's, there's something, the next chapter, you know, a reinvention. So, okay, cool. She was always very supportive. Dude, she supported me <laughs> on mostly everything except when I wanted to become a professional poker player. <laughs> and I, dude, I was so into, I don't know if you were around the height of 2003, four, five, six, seven, eight, where it was like poker craze. Dude. Oh yeah. Yeah. Crazy. WPT, like you could, Phil Ivy, like these things were crazy. Oh yeah. yeah. It was every I watched it. I absorbed it. I got really I became like the 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 the, the home game hero. Yeah. And I was like hosting my own games and like sending people to the world's series of poker. What, what was your game of choice? Hold them? Hold them, of course. Yeah. 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 That was really the only thing I was good at because I just that was I was all in. No fun at it. But I was like, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so that was the only time she ever shot me down. I was like, I'm gonna become a, I'm gonna sell my car. I'm gonna I dude, I was living the you know the bachelor's dream. I had a BMW. I had my own condo and it was like ghetto fab, man. I'm like living oh, in a yeah. condo with a nice car. It's nicer. It's more expensive than where I'm living. Right. But, um, you know, so then like, she was like, no, she was like, I, I just met you. I mean, we were probably dating for a year and she's like, you're not moving in with me. You're not selling your car. You're not selling your condo. Like that was gonna be my bankroll, dude. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, so that whole thing I'm sure cropped up when I said, Hey, I want to become a real estate investor. Yeah. And she, she was like, you don't, you don't know anything about real estate investing. I didn't. And I was like, I'm going to figure it out. And she and I sort of looked at our finances and we found that we had enough runway for about, I don't know, a year to two years. And she gave me free reign to, to test it out and try it because Did she understood the runway. I want to, and that's important for people in terms of what yeah. everyone's runway is different. Like what was your runway? Yeah. A runway for us was, salary. Like I could, if I did, if I stopped working, we could still pay the bills. Yep. Uh, so we had about one to two years roughly. So we basically figured out what's our nut, you know, like what is our annual expenses? Yeah. yeah. And it was less than a hundred thousand dollars, bro. It was 85,000 to be exact, exact, wow. uh, exact. And I was like, Oh damn. Um, you can cover our annual nut. Yeah. So she could cover it. And I could go play <laughs> and figure <laughs> stuff out. Um, but dude, it wasn't, it wasn't just her trust in me, but it was also the concept of it. Like I'm going to be, I'm going to create financial freedom for us, financial mm -hmm. independence for us. So someday you and I don't have to work if we don't want to work. We work now because we, we, we want to work wow. and, and impact, you know, lives and, and change and change things in the world. Even if it's like a little micro you know, yeah. meter sort of, uh, Even move, if it's but... just a conversation, you help somebody in a exactly. conversation. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's how it all happened. Dude. I, it wouldn't happen without her and her love no and support. Question. Cause I, I'd be support. homeless. <laughs> when you're married, having that spousal support on either side in any endeavor is so powerful because oh, yeah. in, instead of, instead of being a headwind and slowing you down, it's a tailwind and it's, it's, it's exalting yes. you and throwing you further and faster. I love that. I think it's so powerful, man. Um, so was it real estate investing initially? And yeah. what was that journey like? And do you still play in real estate? Yeah, I do. So it's crazy. I, um, dude, if it wasn't for real estate investing, I would not have been able to create on-air brands and anything else, else after it, just because that's where the growth mindset and oh, abundance yeah. mindset and the networking and, 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 and providing value and, 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 and giving before getting all that stuff didn't exist in my vocabulary. You know, that was, it was all about me, 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 yeah, you yeah. know, like how much am I going to make if I take that job? Not what am I going to become? You know, it was always about like, oh, what's the next big thing? How can I look cool? What's the new iPhone or the next pair of yeah. shoes I could buy that impresses yeah. my coworkers? <laughs> what car should I be driving? Because that's a suit, you know, like I thought cars were like a three piece suit. And like for me to drive around in the right car represented myself in a way where like people were like, Oh, he's a baller. He, yeah. Let me hang with him. 
dude, all this all stuff, image. yeah, all image and fluff and no substance or depth. It was awful, dude. And dude, yep. honestly, anyone who's listening to this, who's still in that space, it's okay. I was just there four or five years ago. Like it took a long, it's taking, I'm not saying I'm there, Yeah. but fully like integrating different concepts and reprogramming your operating system, upgrading your operating system. That is critical, man. And it's every single day it's work. Yep. It is. And it, it's, it's an identity shift. It's a paradigm shift. Yeah. It's a mentality. It's a mindset. It's a whole, you're becoming something completely different. I was there too, man. I was a poor kid from Boston that didn't have two pennies to rub together growing up. So I had to learn how to hustle as a kid. I had to learn how to sell, buy and trade comic books, baseball cards, shovel <laughs> snow for money. I had to, I yeah. took my entrepreneurial efforts and I turned them into a, a little mini drug enterprise for a couple of years. Like <laughs> I, 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 I tried everything, man. And, and I was, I was always a curious explorer sometimes for good and for evil, but uh, just those two years anyway. But what I say, what I mean to say is like, I always had that entrepreneurial kind of hustle but it came from a place of scarcity. So that was even a mindset shift, go, shift going from scarcity to abundance, mm -hmm. right? And that oh, took yeah. years and gratitude and being thankful for even the bad stuff, even the crazy mm -hmm. shit I've yes. faced in my life. I'm so thankful for it because it brought me to where I am now. Yep. And <clears throat> even fast forward past those years in Boston, when I became an entrepreneur for the first time, you know, like officially, I had this outside sales company with, you know, up to 35 people at any given time that were doing door to door sales. <laughs> Commission, cold call, business to business. They were selling fun and entertainment like Groupon, essentially. Um, and I came into a decent amount of money right away. I was like one of the rookies of the year. I was doing a lot of really good things around the country. There was these franchises. And like, so it was like this big organization, direct sales company. And I remember buying my first car, which was like a Lincoln LS V8, which was like a cool car. Like growing up in Boston, it was like Lincoln and Cadillac. Like, so I went with the Lincoln and that was like, just a really cool, like grandfather car. It was awesome. And I, I remember going, <laughs> what color but, was it? Uh, it was a, like a, a nice kind of charcoal gray. Oh, okay. It was, nice. and it had like nice kind of chrome around. It was a beautiful car, man. It was, it was, it was sweet. Is it a V8? It was a V8. Yeah. What? Yeah. I, I, touched, I touched 150 in that car with five people in it. <laughs> oh, not, not safe at all. And the story real quick was uh, we were, we worked on Saturdays. So we worked six days a week because Saturday was like prime time for what we were doing. And one of I was big, I was big, I'm still big into martial arts, but I was big into UFC at the time. This was like 2006 ish, five, 2005, 2006, somewhere, maybe a little bit later, 2006, 2007 had a guy who's like, let's, where do you want to watch the fights tonight? We're in Charlotte, North Carolina, running my office. It was 2007, 2007. And uh, I was like, let's just go to Atlanta and see the fights live. Cause it was four hours wow, away. Crazy. And, but it was like later in the afternoon, we made this decision. So I had to make up some time. So there were some times where I was hitting the gas. Remember, <laughs> the, the, the time we hit 150 was we were all hungry and it was like seven o'clock and the fights were starting around eight ish. And we were still about an hour. We were going to get to the fights with prelims a little bit late. And uh, we, we all saw crystals, which is like a burger joint, like white castle crystals, yeah. burgers on the side of the road. And everybody's like, let's stop at crystals. But I missed the exit. So I floored it to get back around like the highway oh. on 85 South. We touched 150. And for anyone listening to this, when you drive a Lincoln LS V8, that was like a, a nice car back then, when you go 150 in a car, a sedan size, any little movement that you give it, mm. the car, like it's like a boat, like it just completely like, especially at that speed. So I had to be very careful not to make any big adjustments. Cause like, I think we could have flipped. Like, wow. <laughs> so long story short, I was there too. I was there with the car and the phone and the clothes and the experiences. I remember going down to Orlando for a Christmas break with one of my business partners. We rented a bus that had like TV screens on it. We had like 60 people on the bus. I get down to Orlando and I'm like, I have like a wad of cash and I'm like making it rain, like, <laughs> like literally making it like an idiot, like, like, like got behind some place we weren't supposed to be, but the guy let us up there. We're on stage making it and like, holy shit, what a dumbass! But it was fun. It was, it was, <laughs> it was fun in the moment. But now I look back on it now, I'm like, what an idiot. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. So many, like, I mean, we had to experience it, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't look back and regret in any of those things. I, I the, the the one thing that I would regret, and your your story is freaking hilarious, dude, um, is is not becoming financially aware or financially literate earlier. Yeah. Because I was just like credit card debt, uh, you know, just spending every check. Yes. And I was making a lot of money, Check dude. I was check. making, I was making like in my twenties and thirties over six figures at the time, you know, was a lot. And like, I'm thinking, dude, I wasn't saving crap. And it wasn't until I met my wife where she was like, no, we got to start like 
minding the mint here. Women. What are you doing? You know, women, she's like, you're, yeah, yeah, women I always got to like keep everything in order. But yeah, then we started saving money and started investing money yes. and like starting to make it, you know, grow. You. Yeah. Uh, you know, but yeah. And dude, I was so dumb. I literally, this is a whole like baller mentality. Like <laughs> I, I had a, a New York city apartment and I had an apartment in Princeton, New Jersey, because yeah. I, I didn't want to give up the status of living in New York in the 212 area code. And I, I would, but I worked in Princeton. So every weekend I'd go back to New York and hang out. So dumb until, until <laughs> I, I met a girl, I, I didn't marry this one, but she was like, what are you doing? Why do you have two places? That's so stupid. I was like, really? You need someone to tell you that you respect, you know, and be like, oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe that is dumb. Brother. I, I can't agree with you more. And I'll tell you a similar journey where, um, you know, and, and I'm a, an investment advisor by trade. Now I'm a, I'm a money manager. I run a, a fiduciary business because I set myself on this path after being such a dumbass with money and not having the principles. And it wasn't, it wasn't completely my fault. Like growing up with no money, I didn't have anyone to lead me and say, this is what you do with money. This is how you manage cash flow. This is how you either pay off or leverage debt. This is how you acquire assets. This is how you plan for wealth. This is how you yada, 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 yada. But because I was interested in entrepreneurship, money and entrepreneurship kind of go hand in hand because you need money to be able to run a business, to start a business kind of thing. And so I had to learn about you know money, wealth creation. And so it set me on this path years ago, about 11 years ago to become a wealth manager and all this different stuff. But it took a long time, man. And I was a dumbass with money. I was just throwing it away because I didn't understand saving. I didn't understand investing. I didn't understand multiple revenue streams. So where money is ma made while you're sleeping, like, cause if you can't do that, you'll be working until you die. If you can't find a way to make more than one revenue stream, especially while you're sleeping, it's going to be a tough go. And so once I learned about all these things, I started teaching myself and teaching other people and then getting like more different things in place, but similar journey, man. Very similar. Yeah, I know. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you went from corporates and then you got into real estate investing. Were you fixing, flipping, buy and hold? Were you multiple properties, like uh, units? Like what were you doing? I was trying to do all of it. Yeah. I didn't know. And, and, and <laughs> if you go, if you go to any real estate meetup, investing meetup, you'll find that there's a lot of tire kickers and there's a lot of people trying to figure it out Yeah, because there's so many strategies. So many, it was like wholesaling, there's fix and flip, which everybody knows about because they, they romanticize it on yep. television. And then there's multifamily. Syndication. There's syndication, yeah. exactly. Jinx. But yeah, it, <laughs> it was weird. So like I literally, because so I, I, what really got me motivated and inspired was this Rich Dad, Poor Dad book by yes. Robert Kiyosaki, right? The purple pill, we call it. And, uh, you know, when he introduced Cheryl the Lecter. whole Cheryl Lecter actually like was the, the woman behind that book, uh, oh, Mark, yeah. Vic Mark Victor Hansen, um, who wrote chicken soup for a soul for the soul. Right. One of his best friends is, is Cheryl Lecter. And she's like the one who pretty much wrote that book, but he's like the face and the brand of that book. It's a really interesting story. I found out I've met her in person and she's like, oh. yeah, yeah. Incredible. So sh did she get that story out of him? Like, I guess I, I yeah. have to go back and listen. Like, cause I, she, we, she did this in person speakeasy mastermind that we did and she was in person and she's, but she was like a big proponent of that book. And like, all I ever heard of first step point, I was Robert Kiyosaki, Robert yeah. Kiyosaki. Like right. she had some sort of big interplay with that book. She either wrote huh. it or like did something and like he got the, I don't know if he, they were partners. I don't remember what it was, but yeah, huh. it's a pretty interesting story. Yeah. 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 I got to look into that too. Cause yeah. yeah. If there's a Morpheus behind the Neo, I need to know. <laughs> well, this is her thing is she's the one who's inspired the idea of buy assets, which is mm. real estate's an asset, right? Yeah. So it it yeah. can be. So talk about, sorry, guys. just got me excited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No worries. It's cool. I like the flow of this, you know, rather than um, we were talking earlier about interviewing guests where they just go on a monologue. I like the dialogue. <laughs> a diatribe <laughs> for 60 minutes. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, everybody loves and appreciates, you know, whether it's Tim Ferriss or mainly Joe Rogan at this point where I mean, that's a conversation and people interrupt each other and that's okay because that's a normal conversation. Yes. And if one person's like talking like nonstop for 12 minutes, right? And then like, Bleh. and then, okay, I'm just going to ask a question as the host to keep him going again or her going again. <laughs> but yeah, like pulling that string, like, yeah, oh, there's a snake in my boots. You know, it's like, constant, keep pulling that damn string of yours. <laughs> Anyone who's listening to this, who wants to be a guest on shows, be conscious of how long you're talking. Yes. But anyway, <laughs> yes, that's a great piece of advice. And life, too, like, think about for you, I'm assuming I'm, I'm, I, I want to hear your side of, of, down the road, this part of the conversation, but like the listening that you have to have to be a podcast host yes. and the ability to have conversation. Right. Yeah. 
I, I always adopt the, the, the concept, I forgot who came up with it, but floating a theory. So as a podcast host, it's okay to ask a question, even though you know it may be wrong, to float a theory so that now the guest is like, oh shit, this person's listening. And no, what he said was wrong. Um, so I'm just gonna now expand on that, you know, give more color or context and detail. Yes. But uh, yeah, ex yeah, float a theory whenever you want to. There's no bad or dumb question, even though you may know that's not the right answer. But anyway, um, what was, was there a question? Real, I don't real know. Estate, <laughs> what, real estate, what was your, your, your or what has become, like, what did you start out doing real estate wise? And like, what are you doing yes. with your portfolio? So when I originally started, I, I definitely didn't want to do wholesaling. That just seems like a lot of systems and processes and legwork that I wasn't prepared to do. So wholesaling, if anybody's wondering, um, think of a, a real estate agent, but you don't have your license and you're, you're sourcing properties. You're finding single family, let's say, keep it simple, single family house where there's a motivated seller and that person is probably underwater they're going under foreclosure uh you know they, they inherited the property from someone a uh, family member and they don't know what to do with it they live in another state so then investors come in and they go hey I'll, I'll i'll pay you cash as is leave all the crap in there don't worry about the the renovations i'll take care of it all and then they get it under credit contract for like 50 60 000 but the house is worth on the market double that mm. so then they go to investing meetups and they find investors who want to flip it, right? And they go, hey, bro, I'll sell you this house. Yeah, they don't usually tell you how much they bought it for, but they'll probably just upcharge five to 10K, yeah. right? So like I bought it for 50, it's worth a hundred. I'll sell it to you, Jesse, for 60,000. Yeah. And that's a deal all day because now the investor didn't have to do all the legwork, right? They, they didn't have to sit down with the seller for hours like I used to. Um, so anyway, that's, that's wholesaling. I didn't want to get into PTSD, it. PTSD, a little PTSD. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. PTSD, dude, to uh, <laughs> three hours, uh, one sit down three hours, dude. I listened to this did guy's you close story. The deal? I did not oh, because no, yeah, I didn't, <laughs> I know it was, you know, I felt so bad for the dude, but anyway, um, yeah, yeah. that's the thing about being a good listener too. Like I genuinely gave a shit about the guy and his story. And that was another reason I realized I'm like, I'm probably not good at this because I just sympathize with everybody. Care about people too much to make a yeah. deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I, was, I, I couldn't do it. So uh, I wanted to get into flipping. I started, you know, doing all that sort of stuff. And then I realized this isn't for me either. Um, <laughs> and I realized I wanted to get into multifamilies yes. for the syndication aspect. And I started to educate myself and I took down a two unit my first deal ever after eight months of, you know, uh, education and networking and, you know, getting the confidence and all that stuff. So about eight months into my real estate journey, I bought a, a multifamily and, um, it's crazy because since then things have gone sort of off the script because now I invest with partners on like resorts and hotels, oh, hell yeah. golf course, wineries, stuff like that. That's everything I just said, there's one project. So I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm balling. That's one project. <laughs> um, so, and I was passive there, you know, like I, I got involved in the marketing aspect, you know, and, 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 you know, became a partner that way, sweat equity, but not, um, actively there getting my hands yeah. dirty boots on the ground type of stuff. Yep. No, it's beautiful, brother. I had a similar journey with real estate where, um, you know, as it's, it's interesting because out of. 400,000 financial planners in the United States, only 5% of, 5 of us are fiduciaries, which means we don't have to sell you anything to make any money. We don't have to advise you to buy a product because we're agnostic. We want what's best for you because we get paid when you, when you do well. And it, it removes any conflict of interest. And so um, what's important about that is, is understanding how real estate is so powerful. And if you have a financial planner that's advising you on real estate, nine times out of 10, if not more, they're probably a fiduciary because they don't have to sell you that real estate. They don't have to sell you a mutual fund. They're truly what's doing what's in your best interest. And so if you're someone who likes real estate, if you're someone who's into real estate, that's how some of the, the most wealth in, in the world has always been transferred through real estate. If you look at like the, the vehicle that's done the most wealth transfer, it's real estate, at least up until you know recently. And so, um, cause now there's a whole nother world we're living in. So anyway, right. so, so with real estate, um, if you know what you're doing, you can build a beautiful life. And this is, this is how you can make money while you're sleeping, whether it's multi-unit syndication. Like I learned about syndication about a year ago and I got plugged into all these people. There's like ex um, uh, pro athletes that are into syndication. Like there's like this whole network and I, offline, I'll tell you about some of the names you probably know. If you're in syndication, you probably know some of these people, 
but like even opening up your mind where like there's pools of investors that you can get into multiple dozens to hundred unit places, or like you said, hotels or golf courses or different things. Like just, just being aware of that and, and having the, the growth mindset, the learner, mm-hmm. the curious explorer to go ahead and say, I want to learn about this. I want to do this. This, this is something that, you know, you can just have that lives and breathes outside of your nine to five. Yeah. So you can have a few hundred dollars to thousands of dollars to tens of thousands of dollars rolling in every month while you're, you know, building on air brands or you're building whatever you're doing over here. Is that kind of what, what happened? You were able to build up a little bit of an investment portfolio real estate wise to be able to start building these companies. It all happened at the same time. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And still happening. So (laughs) yeah, yeah. I wish I could say that. Yeah. So I invested time, energy, and effort into, you know, putting chips on top of the real estate stack, but no, I had to do it the hard way and like start two other companies and like start ch- stacking all the chips, you know, at the same time, yeah. which takes a lot longer and it's a lot more stressful. But what I like about this whole chip stack analogy, since we're going back to poker and we both love poker, is that um, I also realized during that time while everything was starting up was I need to create a chip stack of spiritual growth. Oh, I need nice. to start a chip stack of physical growth and yeah. physical, you know, uh, you know, getting healthier, health mindset. and like all these things I started to understand was necessary for me to do that, to grow a real estate party portfolio, to run an, a, a business, you know, and a startup and build teams and inspire teams and people yes. like all that stuff was never going to work if I didn't have my shit together. So like, I was always aware, like little by little by little figuring this out, whether it was adopting, you know, uh, you know, intermittent fasting, which I've been doing for, for several years. And oh, then, nice. um, you know, that changed the game for me. And then it was like waking up at five 30 in the morning or, or, you know, um, um, you know, getting more into faith and spirituality, not necessarily saying like, I go to, I was raised Catholic, but I never practiced Same. being Catholic, Same. you know? <laughs> um, but I have, I have a belief of, you know, this spiritual growth Yes, and that's where, that, that's where the whole abundance giving, you know, offering value, all this stuff, I think stems from, right? The Bible or whatever you want to call the Torah, whatever it is for you. Um, So I'm not like pointing to any particular thing like you. I think we're sort of similar and cut from the same cloth, but all those chip stacks need to happen together because everyone knows a story or maybe knows personally that big, fat, unhappy billionaire or millionaire that has six wives and six has been married six times, right? Super out of shape, miserable, but has all the wealth in the world. Right. Mm. What Mm. good is that shit? Brother, I got a book that I'm finishing up. My first one is called happy wealth. And it plays into so much of what you just talked about. Spirituality is in there, biohacking, like, uh, you know, health and wellness. Um, but think like even the conversation I always talk about with people when I'm on other people's podcasts, I tell people all the time, I was like, rich people have money. Wealthy people have time. Mm. They have the time to be able to do what they want, when they want, how they want. Yes, the money's there because that's going to help them pay for these things. But the health has to be there. The mindset has to be there. Spirituality has to be there. Whatever you believe in spirituality wise, I don't give a shit. But if it's helping you to be a better person to yourself and other people in the world, high fucking five, bro. Get after it. Right. And if you're not hurting anyone or you're not like a, there's a lot of problems with the Catholic church from Boston back in the day. So, <laughs> thankfully I was never an altar boy. I never got learned. learned yeah. You know? Same here, bro. Same yeah. here. <laughs> but you know, not, you know, again, that's just really, it's traumatic, but you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's interesting how these things play into business and how business is a byproduct of your wellness, your mm-hmm. spiritual, mental, emotional, physical wellness. If you have those four things in alignment to some degree, it just bleeds into the quality of relationships. It bleeds into the quality of the business that you do. The reason why you do business, like instead of, I just want to make a million dollars to make a million dollars. Well, I want to do this so that I can help people. I can go on these trips. So I can you know, increase the quality of my life, my people's life, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I think stacking the chips is a great illustration. And it's, it's absolutely in alignment with everything. If you, if, you, if you can just kind of put it all together. Yeah. Yeah. It's so critical. Like people don't understand or realize how, I'm, you know why? Maybe they realize it, but then nobody wants to put the work in, right? Because it takes longer. Like every once in a while, instant gratification. I want it mm, now. I want it now. Mm. I want everything now. I want success now. The thing is, everybody wants to play to their ego. And, and to me, it's ego specifically is like, you want something now that you don't deserve yet. 
Like you want the cred, wow. right? That, that's what Instagram wow. and Facebook and wow. all these personal brands that people are developing. Like look at me and my duck lips is all about <laughs> like, you want, you get angry if something plays to your ego because you didn't fucking put the time, energy or effort into what it is you're trying to front. Like I want cred for this. Like I'm a marketing expert. I'm a podcast expert. I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a real estate expert. Did you put the reps in? Like, did you fall on your face? Did you lose hundreds, if not millions of dollars and learn from that lesson? Fuck, no, then shut up, dude. right? <laughs> we could talk about that for a whole podcast and just yeah. earning it, earning it. Earn it. Because at the end of the day, you have to put the work in. You have to put the reps in. You could be as spiritual you want, as, as good of a person as you want. But if you're not actually getting out there and falling on your face, and getting back up, you know, fall down seven times, get up eight, that whole thing. Like, yeah. and putting in the money. And here's another thing too to entrepreneurship. If you're going to be a great entrepreneur, you better invest the shit out of yourself. Like you better right. go to masterminds. You better go to, so to, to meeting people. You better go get mentors. You better, and, and cycle it through different seasons of life. Like I've had business mm -hmm. mentors. I've had spiritual mentors and I have, I still do, but they, they, they change. And they, as you evolve and grow and not that you're leaving people behind, but you're just adding new things to your life. And I think that that's one big thing. And Warren Buffett, again, uncle Warren will be the first person to tell you best investment you'll ever make is in yourself. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think you just kind of hit it on the head with everything you've been talking about. And so you can't get to a point where you expect success. You have to work for it. At the same time, you have to be willing to like put money into you. You're the best investment you'll ever make. Yeah, dude. And not, not, not just like in 1000%, like you're saying, you got to invest it in yourself. Some people, that's a whole deep conversation because some people don't feel worthy, right? For, of success. So, I've been guilty of that, right? Yeah. You start to taste it and you're like, oh damn, do I deserve this? Right. So you got to do some deep work and yeah, go ahead. I, was, I just got really excited because another level is like you, you, you'll might self-sabotage depending on where you oh, come yeah. from. If you have oh, a scarcity yeah. mindset, you might yep. not even 60 to 90,000 thoughts a day as a human being. And a lot of people, most of them are negative and mm -hmm. a lot of them they don't, they're not even aware of. And so you have to get rid of self-limiting beliefs. You have to do some sub subconscious yeah. mind training and you know, whether it's NLP or Dr. Joe's mm -hmm. dispensa, whatever you're into. I'm sorry, but I got really excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. But the thing is, I forgot my point, but anyway, the, um, <laughs> the <laughs> you keep going, you take, you know, it's point. a good conversation <laughs> when you go off on tangents and like, and get excited about stuff and we have so much to talk about, but so, so, so you, you have had these experiences. And so what was that? And obviously you're still building like, like me, like I have a few yeah. things going on from, you know, what I do and you're, you're building simultaneously so that, you know, you can have this, this, this meaningful impact for yourself and others. But what was that trajectory looking like for you? So real estate into kind of what you're doing now, was there like a, a clearly defined moment where you lost, lost a bunch and you had to reset, reset and recycle, or were you kind of like, like the entrepreneur's journey where you have highs and lows and eventually it kind of starts to even out kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, there were partnerships. There were things that I got involved in that I was like, this is probably, uh, could, could use an upgrade or shift or pivot. Um, you know, there's, there's lessons learned, you know, for example, I'll, I'll take one, you know, and this is ignorance. I, you know, I was doing my first flip and, um, you know, I put money down on the property and, uh, did all the stuff and my due diligence, you know, I checked to make sure everything, the foundation is not cracked and the roof is okay. And, all the stuff that I thought that I was supposed to do. And I had one of my investor friends. I'm like, yeah, man, like, come, come over here. Let's drive past <clears throat> my new house. I'm going to give this one to my firstborn. Like thinking I was all cool trying to copy Brandon Turner uh, from bigger pockets. And then like, <clears throat> he was like, let's go walk around it, bro. So we walked around it and he's looking, he's like, yeah, pretty cool, man. This is a good buy. And then he sees behind bushes, this pipe that's sticking out of the ground that I didn't see. It was really close to the house. And it was probably like, I don't know, an eight inch in diameter pipe and about six inches out off the ground. And he kicks it. He goes, you know what that is? I'm like, no. He goes, that's an oil tank. I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, bro, you got an oil tank underground. It's probably not because I didn't see one in the house. Yes. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> and he goes, dude, if you have an oil tank and you don't get it inspected, there might be a crack in it. And if you, there's a crack and it means oil is seeping through the soil and you are responsible for every house that it damaged, like soil, like it, it could have leaked for miles. So I was like, oh damn. So then I called up the, the homeowner. I'm like, yo, you know, you got an oil. Like, no, I didn't know there was a, what do you mean? There's an oil tank. And like, I was like, I'm pausing all activity. I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I'm not buying this until you get it inspected, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, long story short, I pulled out of the deal and I educated that guy too, who owned the house. He didn't even know there was an oil tank in there. But 
dude, I lost money. I lost thousands of dollars of down payment because I, because I walked away from the deal, right? I'd rather lose thousands than lose hundreds of thousands down the line because I made a huge mistake. Um, and that was a lesson learned, you know, because I was arrogant. That's the thing, dude. If you are out there and you walk to a, you walk into a room, say it's a marketing or real estate investing or you know, crypto, whatever it is. And you walk in and think, you know, everything. And I was that dude. I'm like, yeah, I don't need to listen to this. I don't need to take notes. I know what I'm doing. I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> you are closing yourself off to growth. Like yes. you don't know everything. No one knows everything. If you're listening to a meeting that's like an hour long and in minute 59, they say one little thing yes. like that, check the pipe for the oil tank, which I probably wasn't listening to because I thought I was the shit. Like there, wait for that one nugget, like this podcast. You may be thinking like, oh yeah, these guys are so full of themselves. They just keep talking, talking, talking. Meanwhile, wait for the nugget that's gonna change your life. It may or may not come, but. And, and even the, the, the perspective of no matter where you are, what you're doing, you can always learn something. No matter who you're talking to, they could be someone who's brand new to life. They could be a super so young. So true. Dude. So true. I was talking about that yesterday about my daughter. Like, I was like, I listen to her. She gives me advice. She's seven years old. She's like, dad, did you know you're a blah, blah, blah. I'm like, thank you for adding a chip to the self-awareness yes. stack. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they're, they're, they're sacred mirrors. So any, any relationships that you have that you deem is it the most important parents, spouse, children, mm -hmm. they will show you exactly who you are for better or for worse. And, uh, I've learned and, you know, specifically on my spiritual journey has been really heavy for the last almost two years. Um, my kids are my best teachers. They will teach me when I'm angry. They'll teach me when I'm impatient. They'll teach me when I'm extra loving, extra kind, mm. because they're just these beautiful mirrors, man. And they're just these, these, these beacons of truth. And they just, they're, they're bodies of energy. And so they'll just say things that, that yeah. come through them and unfiltered, them unfiltered. Yeah. And for me, man, it's been a beautiful way of you know, prior to, uh, you know, two years ago, got divorced. And uh, my now was wife was a really good friend of mine. We co parent the shit out of our, our kids We're really still really close. And, um, you know, it, it took that uh, introspection away from that. And it took that kind of that change in relationship to really realize because up until that point was people would always say, you're a really good dad, you're really, you're a really good dad. And I believed it because I felt like I was being really good. Plus my role model was a heroin addict. Like my dad, not even a role model, but my dad was a heroin addict. And so like, I had this like, all right, like I'm doing a lot of different things than that. So like, I feel like, you know, and then when I realized, I realized I wasn't even playing the game where I could play it or just mm. being authentic or showing up the way that I could be. So as much as people would say, you're a really good dad, you're really involved. Well, for me, I realized that wasn't even scratching the surface. And it took mm. my kids teaching me, my seven-year-old and almost five-year-old in a few weeks, um, to show me where I wasn't showing up for them and, and having that awareness and that, that humility to say, you know what? I do suck here. I, I'm sorry. Right. And telling them that, Hey, thank yeah. you for teaching me that. They, like it's a beautiful journey, man. I'm just, I'm excited to be a part of the ride, man. Yeah, exactly. Dude. I didn't realize our kids are in the same, like I have a seven and a four year old. So yeah, that's why there's a lot of weird stuff here. That's unspoken. Um, but yeah, we boys, girls, I think both boys, me. seven and four, the, the youngest one will be five October 12th. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool as hell, man. You know, I realized what's cool about this podcast. I'm going to get a little meta here. Um, this could be repurposed. I was like, I was going to have you on my show, but we've been sort of going back and forth, like in such equal terms. I'm like, this could be an entrepreneur circle <laughs> podcast because <Yeah. laughs> I'm getting to know you. And just, let's just go back and forth. It's all like equal. It's, it's great, man. I've I done that it. before recently. I had a buddy, uh, his name's Sebastian. Sebastian is another one of these, these uh, people that you love. He's He's big into health and wellness, but he's on his spiritual journey as well. Uh, he's from Sweden, so he's kind of got that that background too. And he looks like a Norse god, like he's just. <laughs> he's dude. And he and I met at this spiritual retreat years ago, and we've done podcasts together. And two weeks ago, we we're supposed to have this business meeting. I was we we're gonna trade and you know things and like help each other business wise. And then we just start talking. And all of a sudden the conversation gets to the point. It's like, do you want to just hit record? Cause it was supposed to be like this business thing. Yeah, and yeah. the whole point of me saying this was by the end of the conversation, it wasn't like a, his podcast, my podcast, cause we both have one. It was just like a great conversation. I was like, we can just use this for either podcast. Yes. Yeah. So I'm yeah. trying to get into these conversations now where it's like kind so of like multi-purpose, man. This is really cool. If you think about it, it's such a time. I mean, like we're probably going to have multiple conversations, uh, you know, but I like the intro being, we could just repurpose this one. 
you know, even though we could do other podcasts together, oh, yeah. you, you know, you just reminded me of, I'm so glad you brought up Sebastian and, 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 and Sweden. I watched this show on Netflix, uh, over the weekend, uh, the, not the movies that made us, it was, it was sort of in the line where it was, um, oh, it was, uh, this is pop. And it was talking about like the early days of like boy bands and then the early days of this and that. And anyway, there was an episode dedicated to why Sweden has become the hub for creating number one hits in like musical really? pop hits. I didn't yeah. Know that. yeah. Dude, have you ever heard? And, and basically it all comes down to, even though they only scratched the surface of this and they didn't like fully embrace that this is the reason why Sweden just kills it in the number one hits for decades. Um, a, a word that is only, I believe, in the Swe Swedish language, jantelagen. Have you ever heard of this word? Dude, jantelagen means it's the law of jante, meaning like you can't write. There's like personal branding or you rising up or you like shouting and saying I'm the best or humble bragging, whatever it is. That's not part of the culture, bro. Like it's a socialist culture where they're like, no, everyone's the same. Everyone's equal. Stay quiet, stay humble, which I appreciate a lot of that, right? Having humility and, and being humble. But <laughs> dude, I think the reason that they are so good at creating number ones for Taylor Swift and Demi Lovato and all these, you know, even way back, like uh, I think the Eurythmics may have been another back in the, no, no, it was Ace of Base. Ace of Base. Anyway. Dude, because they don't have a vehicle for which they can really express themselves as this uber creative and have a vehicle to like shout, you know, from the stage and be like, I'm number one. Like they're not allowed to do that shit. So they do it through us Americans. That's crazy. It is. And dude, the show only hinted at that, but it's all Jante Logan, man. Jante Logan. I'm going to say that yeah. next time I talk to Sebastian. Yeah, talk to him and be like, dude, what's up with Jante Logan? Yeah, the law of Jante. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brother. It's amazing, man, the different influences. I was talking to a buddy earlier on another podcast. Uh, his name is Seven Jacobs. And he's this. Young, his name is Seven Jacobs. That's such a great name, Seven Jacobs. His real name is, is, is like is like government name. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Is the number seven or S E V E? S E V E. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. Is it a one word or is it like his middle name is Jacob? Uh, the Jacobs. Seven Jacobs is his whole name. Like Seven is first name. Seven. Wow. Jacobs, and he's he's a conscious entrepreneur. He's like this. He's 22 years old. He's seen a ton of life. He's seen a ton of really cool stuff in a short amount of time. Like he's lived in Nepal and like, he's like this, he actually was homeless. He was actually, there's level, he taught me about homelessness. He's like, homeless is like when you don't have a residence to call your own, but rough sleeping is where you don't have like a bed to sleep on. So like he would, he told me about a time he was living with his dad out in the UK. And the reason, I'll tell you why I brought this up, but he was um, rough sleeping in an apartment they used to live in that was like, they had been vacated from and like it was going under construction. No one was living in this building, but they still had the key. And so like three months, they were like sleeping in the closet of their old apartment. It was crazy. And this kid's so wise beyond his years. He's beautiful. You might want to connect with him. I'll plug him in. Yeah. But, um, reason why I bring him up was because the idea of how culture and how economies are so different. So he's like, in the UK, it's not super cool to be an entrepreneur. It's not like, it's kind of like frowned upon until you've made millions and millions and millions of dollars. We're here in the US, like being an entrepreneur is like, cool. It's like, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like a thing. And he's like, but he's like, even to take it to another level. He's like, Hong Kong is even bigger than that. So like, it, like in Hong Kong, he's like, because he had like a really best friend from there. He's like, being an entrepreneur in Hong Kong is like insanely impressive. So it's like, just thinking about Jante Logan in Sweden and like how they're having an impact on the world. It's amazing how the world plays with like each other in different arenas, man. Yeah. 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 And it's all, it's all one thing, man. I mean, we yeah. can get super deep about that, but you know, it's like. Collective yeah, consciousness, man. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can put you. So, so, okay. So, so you go from real estate, doing some deals. How, how and what pulled you into the podcast world? Because that's, would you do a real estate podcast? Did you just hear enough Tim Ferriss? You're like, shit, I want to do my own. Like, which is what I did. Like, what, what, what was it that pulled you in? And like, what was that first iteration for you? Yeah, it was a, it, it was a solution to a problem, right? That I was having. And that main, that main problem was people confused about what the hell I was doing. So I left corporate, right? Everybody knew me as this creative guy, but then I started talking about real estate and I started doing a lot of Facebook lives. I started doing YouTube channel. Yeah, I had my own YouTube channel. I was like, real estate, real estate, all day, real estate and investing. And, um, people were asking me like at barbecues and stuff like, dude, what do you do, man? I thought, are you, you're not in creative anymore. I'm like, nah, I'm retired. And they're like, okay, well, you, you, what are you doing? You're flipping houses. That's what everybody thinks and knows and understands, right? Cause it's all on television. 
you flip it houses. I'm like, no, I'm actually buying multifamilies, you know, buy and hold you ever hear. And then I got to explain the whole thing. I'm like, you know, I get tenants, blah, blah, blah. you change the toilets, you know? So anyway, <laughs> I was like, what if I just had one place where people can go if they had any questions, they'll hear my story. Right. And that was the podcast. So I created entrepreneur circle really just as a vehicle to like, Hey, just go listen to my show. If you want to know more. And it worked for a while um, and still works, but it's kind of evolving, has evolved. Uh, but the cool thing about this bro was, so On Air Brands at the time was a straight up marketing play, right? Marketing agency, yes. traditionally, uh, you know, just in a traditional sense, like we do websites, we do logos, we do branding, we, we do some marketing strategies for you. So that was On Air Brands. And then um, the podcast came to be as, uh, as the first, chip for personal branding. And then people I started to interview were mostly real estate investors because that's what I was around all the time. And it was always like, man, this conversation is gold. Wow. Yes. Why am I not recording? So then now yes. it became an opportunity to be like, Hey, you want to be on my podcast? So at the time it, podcasting was starting to like gain more traction, not like it is now, but people were like, Oh, you got a podcast. That's cool. Yeah, sure. One turned into then dozens. And then all of a sudden these, <laughs> people who I was interviewing became partners, they became clients, they became friends. Like till this day, the top three or four <laughs> downloads are business partners of mine. Yeah. Like we became partners. And then, so I'm like, whoa. And then they started to go, Eric, I love my episode. They never listened to my show, but they listened to their episode. Yeah. So they're like, <laughs> man, that episode show was killer. Would, would you be able to do one for me? And it was like, yeah, sure. And then it became me and then became we, and then it just became a service. Yes. So that's all we do now. We just shed all that heavy lifting for, for marketing and branding that was, was always challenging. Um, and then I rejiggered the whole team and everything to just build podcasts, create podcasts and, and, and do the social media marketing behind it. It's beautiful brother. How long have you been on that path for company OABs uh, on your brands is three, four years old now. Nice dude. Yeah. Nice. And, and like what you said that really stuck out to me and all that, which was everything, but the, the value and the quality of your life that it's brought in from business to business partnerships, to friendships, to experiences, to your own learning. Like I say this all the time, people are like, what do you love about your podcast? I'm like, it's a masterclass on life. It's an absolute masterclass on life. More than that, I'm, my, the two most important things in this world are time and relationships. And the relationships that the podcast has brought into my life, like, like we're going to do some life together, you and I, no, no question. Do some business together, life together, whatever, whatever the journey leads but it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for this medium. Exactly. We wouldn't have met. We, only, we, we were introduced because of a podcast. Right. And, and so I'm very thankful because A, I get to learn. Like I've learned a shit ton of, from you and I'm excited to continue our journey. And then B, it's literally, I can tell you the people that are in my financial planning business because of the podcast. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the, the, the almost uh, contrarian way that the marketing was done because I'm never talking about finance on the podcast. I'm never giving people investment tips on the podcast because it's fucking boring. Like who the hell wants to talk about that all day? For me, <laughs> for somebody else, it might not be. But because right. I do it for a living, I'm like, I don't want to talk about this shit. I want to talk about psychedelics. I want to talk about sports. I want to talk about Eric. Like I want to talk about all this shit. And yeah. it's just giving me this beautiful, like it's, it's also the best business card too. Because people ask me what I do. I always leave with the podcast first because mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's fun. And then the financial planning and then the retreat business. So it's, it's been great. Yeah. So true, man. There's nothing like it. I, you know, I, I've been in marketing all my life and never embraced, you know, I, I, I've probably had the first iteration of a iPod, you know, and I think the first podcast that I ever listened to was the nerdist with Chris Hardwick. Oh yeah. Love back Chris in the Hardwick. day. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, he's awesome. But that was all I knew it was like, it was an entertainment sort of value add, uh, where I could listen to it on my commute and laugh. Um, uh, and then, you know, Tim Ferriss was like the first sort of entrepreneurial Same. show that I listened to. Uh, and then, and then bigger pockets, when I was really starting to get into investing and, and, and trying to educate myself on the go, it became bigger pockets. And that's when it hit me like, oh shit, podcast could be like an educational sort of, uh, platform and, uh, and a forum to, to meet people. I started meeting people. That's what it was, dude. On the bigger pockets podcast, I started reaching out to guests that were on that show Hell yeah! and then starting having meetings and coffee and, and they became coaches and mentors. And I'm like, holy crap, huh? Podcast is cool. It's not like radio. I can't call up like Ryan Seacrest and be like, yeah, bro, you want to have some, have some coffee? You know, like, it was like, no, but I could call up a guest on Bigger Pockets and be like, yo, let's have some coffee and do some deals. 
What a beautiful hack too, because like, if you think about it, most people that are on podcasts as guests want to be on more podcasts. So at the very least, you can find more podcast guests just by talking to the guests of other podcasts. Like, what, a, <laughs> what a beautiful mind fuck. It's like, okay, because well, I remember yeah. when I first got started, I knew nothing, right? And I'm still like, I'm three years in now and it's like, I'm still learning so much, but like, I have a lot of ex- good experience. And uh, when I first started, I was like, where am I going to get people that want to talk? Like, where am I going to get? And like, I knew I had a great network from business and from relationships, but, like, but where am I going to get enough people and I was shooting one episode a week. I was shooting multiple, but I was putting out one episode a week. And um, it just started snowballing, man. Mm. It was like, go talk to this person. Or I'd reach out and be like, hey, who do you know will be a good fit? And then like, as I evolved over the years, my conversation started getting more into like spirituality and yeah. these different retreats and this different stuff. that, And like, it all comes back around like business and all this different stuff. It was like, people just started getting placed on my lap. And it's like, then you start making connections with other podcast hosts. Or people that help people get on shows. And then all of a sudden it's like, there's too many people. It's like, it's like, what do I, I'm only putting out three episodes a week. I'm shooting like, today. You're my fourth, like my fourth conversation. It's like, I don't even have enough time to, to, yeah. to do it all. So it's, it's, it's just one of those things where I think both of our journeys are similar in a lot of ways, but with the podcast, it's like, just get started, do something that interests you and like, just stay the course. Just don't quit. The only time you fail in my life in my purview is, it, is if you just, stop doing what you're doing because it it took a loss, right? And maybe you take a learning lesson and you move on because it's just not helpful or healthy. But at the end of the day, if you fail, but you keep moving forward from that failure, you're not going to quit. You're not going to lose. So true. It's so true. I mean, people like the biggest hack for me, or it was a really a realization. It it was like the first zeros and ones that dropped into my brain. I was like, wait a minute. This is, this is, yeah, it was the matrix. It was, it was, it was the, it was definitely part of the pill where when I read this quote and I was like, if I ever, I don't have any tattoos, bro, but if I ever got one, it would be uh, failure is success and progress. Yes. And when I, dude, I didn't grow up like that. Like my dad was always like, failure you're a loser like failure is not an option yeah you know like yeah. like i was in nasa or something you know or like, like, <laughs> like high, high level military like you cannot no fail situation exactly and I, that was ingrained in my every fiber of my being but when i finally realized oh shit, i can learn lessons like uh, uh, this is how you succeed you have to fail in order to yeah. succeed like that was huge for me um but yeah i mean it's 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 always an evolution and it's always uh sticking with it because like you said the if you ever look at anything as a failure first off it shouldn't hurt you should be able to extract lessons from that sure but if you look at it as a failure a big f it's because you quit it's yeah. because you stopped doing whatever the heck you were doing you didn't stick with it long enough i love this analogy i forgot where i heard this recently but the dude was talking about the the chinese bamboo oh yeah You've heard this. Yeah. The whole thing, like you could plant that bamboo seed and it takes four five, six years for anything to ever get, but you got to keep going to that same spot and watering yes. it and watering it and watering it with the hopes that it's, but once it comes out like a forest, like overnight. And it's like that, man, people don't want to put the work in. It's like, put the freaking work in. They keep, keep tending to that garden, man. Yeah. There's so many, I can't like offline. I'll tell you about all these different, like, uh, illustrations or like, uh, like these, like, um, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but if not plant it today kind of thing, yeah. like there's like these whole, like, sorry, like Bruce, I think, I don't know if it was Bruce Lee or if it was just him and a meme, but it was like, I'd rather be uh, a warrior that gardens versus a gardener in a war kind of thing. So like there's all these <laughs> illustrations with like planting shit, and, like, like the garden, but it's so true, man. It's like, keep tending to what you're doing, learn how to fail forward, right? Like yeah. sports is one of the best illustrations for something like this because you don't win every game, right? Matter of fact, if you're above a 500 team, you're considered like you've done well for the year, right? Mm-hmm. So that means that means win 51, lose 49. So you've lost 49 <laughs> times in a year. It's like that's the same thing for business. You're gonna yeah. you're gonna have a Second. podcast episode that might not be great. You're gonna have a business deal that might fall through. You're gonna have uh, a vendor or whatever you're doing for your business that just doesn't work out. It's like, but that doesn't mean you quit the entire game. You just get up again and play a different part of the game. You do do something different. And that's the one thing I love about business, specifically entrepreneurship, is. For creative people, um, it is it is unbelievable. Like what what you can do, it's an art form. It's absolutely an art form. Like what you can do, like with your podcast company and with the real estate that you've done and the th- different things you have going on in your life. It's all it's all predicated on what you deem it to be. You're the creator. You're the architect. And I think that it's it's so attractive. And I feel like that I I've even started to reframe this in my mind. Like I've been very creative in my businesses and different things I've done. But like I'm getting to a point now. I'm like man, I just want to shake it up. 
I just want to do something completely different and like look at it from a different lens. And that, that invigorates me. So, so there's this thing for people listening and watching called uh, human design and human design tells you kind of like how you operate as a person. And I'm what's called a manifesting generator. And that means I need to be lit up about shit. But the thing about being an entrepreneur is if you only have one thing, like you're going to get bored after a while. So you have to find for me anyway. So like for, I have to find different things like the retreat business or the podcast or the financial planning business. And like knowing that about yourself, well, now you have the tools and the keys to be able to create whatever you want. Have you, have you noticed that like along the way with being a, 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 a you know, what you do as an entrepreneur, are you, are you doing creative things that kind of bring you joy? Like, or are you more just kind of set it and forget it? Like how's your entrepreneurial journey been? Yeah. I mean, I found that, you know, and this is all recent, you know, over the past several years, um, I, I, I'm driving and I'm getting, I'm getting enjoyment out of and gratification out of helping others and, and, and seeing them succeed and having them, you know, for example, we had a team meeting this morning and we brought on a podcaster, uh, as a client who, you know, my, my mission in life. And I told you this earlier multiple times is that, you know, to, to make the world a better place, one mic at a time. Love it. Right. And how do I do that? It's through podcasts like this. It's your mic. It's my mic. It's me speaking on a stage. It's me introducing you to David Meltzer, who will, you'll speak on his stage. You know, examples where like, it's not, it doesn't have to be me, but if I made the introduction or if I connected the dots for someone where they made an impact because I helped to make the, the connection, things like that. Um, or, or finding speakers to speak on my stage, whatever it is, it involves a mic, right? This, so that's, that's the whole mission. But we brought on this new real estate investing show and she's a she's a filipina uh she she was born and raised there we lives in the states now and she's financially independent right meaning she doesn't if she stopped working today all her bills are paid right but if you look at her you you know would generalize and i could say this because i'm filipino you would think she's a va right she's this little unassuming super humble woman but dude she's inspiring the shit out of my va team so now they're listening to her shows that are on our platform and they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, that could be you. I'm going to empower you. Do you guys want a meeting where we can now get together? It's not a team meeting. It's not about on our brains, but it's about you, your life and your family and how let's, we can level up your game by bringing her in who's inspiring you clearly. And if you leave because you want to become a real estate investor, hopefully they're not listening to this episode, you know, more power to you. I've just changed the world, dude, one yep. mic at a time, right? Mm -hmm. And there it is, the little things, you, you don't even know how this all s scatters and fragments and you know affects everything. So that's just one example, but anyway, yeah. That's also to. legacy though, in a, in, in a way yeah. of, uh, you know, you drop a, a rock in a pond, the ripples that it, that it mm -hmm. and even, even long beyond us and our time here on earth, yeah. like the things that we've said and done and the, the in, like, I've had people tell me whether it's through the podcast or conversation, like the impact that they've had, whether it was a guest or something I said, whatever it was. And like, I would have never thought twice about it because it's just something I've done for years or something they've done for years. And it's just part of their journey, but like, it's, it's life-changing for somebody else. And so you just never know. And uh, it's funny because you talk about changing the world one mic at a time or, or, or leaving the world a better place. And obviously we're both very heart centric dudes and, you know, and we deploy that in our business and our relationships. Um, and I know that, you know, we, you know, I don't know how far you want to get into this, but I get into it super deep, but I, uh, I've been working with plant medicines for a couple of years and I go on journeys where I sit with things like ayahuasca and mushrooms and San Pedro and DMT and all these different, uh, modalities and different teacher plants to get beautiful insights when it comes to spiritual, uh, business relationship, healing trauma and different things like this. And, uh, you made me think of my most recent journey where I was down on this Mexico journey with few of my brothers and uh soul brothers and uh we were hopping from tulum to chichen itza and then left through cancun and we did one plant medicine journey while we were down there and we worked with dmt and dmt is the spirit molecule it's uh tony robbins joe rogan mike tyson have all been elevated as humans because they've they've tried this mm. and actually two of those three have been down to this place we went to so we actually got to work with a guy that worked with them which was really cool yeah and uh you have to set intentions when you do this type of work. It's like meditation. It's like other things that you can use. Um, breath work, you can set, you know, intentions. And my intention, my biggest one was to heal the world. But I was afraid to ask for that. Like with, with I was like, I, so I walked up to the guy who was like the shaman essentially. And I said, I have two intentions. Is there any intention too big? And he goes, no. I was like, I want to heal the world. And 
the reason why I thought about this is because I was thinking on such a grander, like bigger, maybe egoic level of like uh, through the podcast or through business or like, how am I going to heal the world? Because we're in such a dark time right now. Mm. And by the end of it, the answer I got was love. And the answer was also, you don't necessarily, you can do that. You can go at scale and build relationships and business partnerships where you can get the message out to heal the world, but it's one-on-one. Mm. It's the one-on-one conversations. It's the one mic at a time. I've had another plant medicine journey that says use, speak, speak freedom of, speak truth to teach, speak, sorry, sorry, I have to think about it. Use your microphone to speak the truth and teach freedom. Hmm. This is something that was just like given to me, like in like the best way we could describe it is go back to uh, the matrix. And, you hmm. know, for anyone who hasn't seen this movie, this is not a spoiler alert. It's been out for like 20 <laughs> years, but in the matrix, Keanu Reeves is brought into this world. He's realized the entire life he's lived is full of shit. It's conjured. It's zeros and ones. It's, it's, it's the system. And when he unplugs from the matrix, he's in this dystopian fractured and doomsday apocalyptic scenario, but he can always tap back into the matrix. And when you learn how to use the matrix to your advantage, you can learn these skills. So the very first scene in the movie, that's super cool is Morpheus plugs him into a Kung Fu scene. He fights Morpheus. He comes out and he's like, I know Kung Fu. And it's the coolest thing. That's what happens on plant medicines. You come back from these journeys. You're like, I know how to do X, Y, Z. I, I can mm. do this now. And so long story short, one of my downloads in the most recent journey was one mic at a time, but it was, it was sharing love in each conversation that I have. And that's how you can change the world from the mm. micro eventually to the macro. Love it. Yeah, dude. Yeah. You can, you I do one done, with me sometime. I know, man. <laughs> it, I told you earlier, you know, this is days ago when we first spoke that uh, I like it, the universe is pointing me in that direction because I had this conversation one-on-one during dinner at one of my masterminds and uh I, you know I, I want to introduce you guys as well please uh but he was talking about that shit and i was like dude like i'm super curious about this because i think i'm ready um and i know all the precautions and all the measures and all the stuff that you have to do to sort of surround yourself with a, a pleasant experience yes. but i'm also ready for you know the bucket like he told me he was puking and then like it was like <laughs> worms coming out of his mouth uh. and he was like i was freaking out and then he goes and then later on i looked down into the bucket it was like a thimble full of like spit or something. But in my mind, he was like, so get ready. It's, it's going to be a crazy experience. Yes. Um, but yeah, and there's going to be a lot to unpack, bro. Like, you know, I've wrestled with my demons, especially during this time of growth and spiritual, you know, awareness and awakening and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cool, man. I, I I'm super curious and interested in, in, in how it all works and what becomes, you know, what do I become? What's the next level, man? It's all about leveling up. One thing I just wanted to point out to the audience here, who's, who's sticking in with us and thank you for, for sticking into two crazy, passionate, insane dudes, uh, just, just shooting the shit, um, is when you're starting a business or you're in a business and you're, you're doing all this stuff and you're looking for success and you're trying to get to the next level, whatever it is. And this is super cliche, I understand, but I want to explain my version of it. You got to come straight, like authentic and genuine. And this is what I mean by it. If you don't, right, if you're like in it with commission breath or you're in it to make that next dollar and you're looking at someone and you're faking the funk from pretending that you're interested in what they're saying and it's not straight up love and you're not tethered, uh, you know, that connection isn't really truly there, people can tell. And the thing is, if you do that from a good place because you put the fucking work in every single day on yourself because it can't come correct and it can't come from a genuine place unless you're doing the work to be happy with yourself yep number one that person that you're alone with if you can sit with your own thoughts and not freak the fuck out and be happy right then you can genuinely when someone comes to you with a win celebrate that win with them and not start thinking about you and your shit and like oh, i'm i'm feeling a little jealous here uh you know what was my win that i can up his win and yes. you know all that nonsense goes away when you're talking to someone who's got it figured out or is figuring it out like we are and they're like yo i'm fucking i'm so proud of you man yes. wow let, let's go out man let's do something or you know did you tell your wife or did you tell your husband or whoever it is like celebrate the wins with people who can celebrate genuinely with you and you know you're on the right path it's it's you said that fucking perfectly man there's a couple of things i want to talk about really quickly from that but it's just gratitude and it's 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 once you've seen enough things in life and you've started to heal those things whether it's through a therapy it's spiritual journey it's through relationships whatever it is 
you start to have this gratitude and this abundance mindset, this, this ability, there's, there's plenty of us, there's plenty to eat. Like, you know, even it, like I've, I've literally started out my, my financial planning career when I went independent uh, after a few years of working in a bank by taking what would be considered my competition and turning them into allies mm. because there's just enough, like how many podcasts are there in the world right now? <laughs> Over a million. Right. And I talked to you how I was starting to like get called to like start a little podcast production company. And you're like, I can tell you about some stuff. Like you have this abundance mindset yeah. where like, we're never going to step on each other's toes. As a matter of fact, we're going to add more value to one another. We're going to bring more value in than we could ever not have together. And I think that having that mindset and separate from that mindset, which was really funny. And I knew this, I knew exactly what you said without ever hearing it before. And it was so fucking funny. You said commission breath. And as soon as you said commission breath, I was like, I know exactly what he's talking about because we used to call it having dollar signs in your eyes. So this old sales organization that I used to run back in the day, it was like, we were working on commission. We were called call door to door business to business. And we had to sell these things, sell these little packages that were like Groupon. So it was like uh, tickets to a sporting event or restaurants or hotels. It was, it was fun and entertainment, but we had to sell door to door and it was cold call. It wasn't easy. And you could tell if someone was uh, coming from a scarcity mindset that needed to make a few bucks that day, because we got paid every day for what we sold. It was beautiful. It was beautiful in the sense that if you went out and crushed it, you were bringing home a couple hundred bucks. And if you went out and ate shit, you got a, you rolled a donut, you made zero. Right. <laughs> and so, and so when you said commission breath, I used to see people all the time, get dollar signs in their eyes. They'd walk in, they'd go through their presentation. They wouldn't give two shits about what the person was saying or how they were feeling. And all they were like, was like, buy my shit, buy my shit, buy my shit. And people can feel that mm -hmm. people can feel when they're being disingenuous or when they're being mm -hmm. sold to people hate being sold to people love to buy. People mm -hmm. fucking love to buy. They want to buy shit on that's going to make them feel good, stuff that's going to solve a problem for them. But if you're going in there and you're like, buy my shit, you have to buy my shit, they're not going to buy it. Yeah. Commission breath. I love it. But the thing I want to add to that, dude, I know we're, we're over our time here, is that um, you're, if you're trying to sell something to someone that doesn't necessarily need what you have to offer, that's disingenuous too, because you're not coming at it like, am I giving them, am I solving the problem that they have? Right. Because like if you, and just move on. That's okay. There's millions and billions of people out there yeah. that will need what you have. So just keep looking. But if you try to force it and you try to sell something and like they don't even need the product or you don't believe, that's the thing, dude. Commission breath comes a lot from not just desperation, but like people who are selling shit to others that they yes. don't fucking need it. Right. So don't sell them on something that they're probably going to piss away. Here's the thing about these gurus that especially like in real estate investing, where they <laughs> sell these packages that are 10, 20, 30, $50,000, right? Wow. You either put it on six credit cards, right? They don't give a shit about you because they just want the money and they're not worried about the fact that you're 88 years old and you probably won't execute on this, you know, like come correct, come honest and genuine really truly try to help people and that will build your reputation which is your brand and your brand over time if you're in it for the long haul will understand this brand on air brands eric cabral jesse t all these people they they're not a flash in the pan it's been years <laughs> and they're still here and they're still offering value because they haven't shit the bed they haven't built a, a, a negative and bad reputation for just wanting money and, 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 and being disingenuous and not caring about other people. So I think that it's so cool that we met because that's where it's all, what it's all about. And people that's don't right. understand, like, that's so simple, but you got to work on yourself to figure that out. Mic drop, baby. Mic drop. How you make your money is more important than how much money you make. Yeah. It's so fucking true. And how you make people feel along the process and, 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 that's being a fiduciary. A fiduciary is someone who doesn't fuck over their clients. You're a mm. steward of other people's interest and money before your yeah. own. Dude, so true. you're a fiduciary in the podcast space. You're a fiduciary as a human. I love I you, man. That. You're amazing. Yeah, you're mighty. You're powerful. And I can't wait for our next conversation, brother. Yeah, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Take care.